want to welcome you to our Empowered series, okay? And that's our little graphic for it, and the idea is the Holy Spirit coming down on people and doing His ministry, God's ministry through people, okay? Now, the thing that we have been going uh, these last couple of days, apparently I'm going to have that problem again, uh, just for those who were helping me with that, uh, where it cuts out. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And it's very clear when he says that, that he's talking about miracles, signs and wonders. The spirit through, that's not just healing, that's miracles and prophecy and all kinds of different things. Gifts in 1 Corinthians, I'm really cutting out bad. Does anybody know? Uh, could you just do me a favor? Could you grab that thing and just bring it over here as, as far as you can? Okay. Yeah, just, yeah, get rid of everything. All right. Because uh, I, I want, I really, this is a very important day. In fact, you know what? Who's going to pray for us today? Okay. Kathy Miller, you start us off right. This is just a really interesting day, and we just want the Lord to cover it completely. So would you just pray for that? Thank you. Father, I think we all need to bow our heads and close our eyes. We need to connect. Amen. We need to look upward, and we look, need to look inward. We need to hear your voice. We need to depend on your Holy Spirit to give us truth. We need to understand how much you love us. And we need to see that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives that we have no idea that's what's about to begin. Thank you. So here we are, Lord. We heard it before. Use us. Amen. By the power of your Holy Spirit who lives within us. Amen. You are holy, you are righteous, you are just. You are merciful. And you are our Father. Thank you for your Son. And please spread the feeling we've got right now throughout every church in Bellevue. Amen. And we will be very, very careful to give you the honor and the glory for all that you are doing and are about to do. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. And thank you, guys. So, again, it's very clear that what he's talking about is doing the works as in the Holy Spirit, as in God doing the work through. And what he says is, and even greater works because I'm going to be the Father. And the challenge that we laid out last week that you've now seen in emails and so on is, the challenge that we've laid out there is, is do you believe that the Holy Spirit is moving through you as much as your heart tells you that he could be? Because if he's not, then there's a gap. And it's the gap that we're talking about today. In order to do this, I just want to do one real quick little thing. I just, how many people in here would say, and I'm going to be very specific about this, so wait until I get done before you raise your hands, okay? But I want you to answer this question. How many people in here can say that they have witnessed a genuine miracle? And, and I'm not talking because I love the way that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be in another procedure. And a doctor, and I thank you for praying for him, and thank you for the skill of the doctors, and thank you for God holding all of that stuff in his hands and so on. So I got no issues with doctors and all that kind of stuff. They're wonderful. But I'm talking about something that genuinely was not the doing of a doctor. That genu and we're talking about healing. Again, we're talking about everything in the end. But we're just sort of locating it on healing because it's kind of like if we get the healing right, I feel like we're going to be getting other things right. That's sort of pretty, you know, rubber meet the road place. So what I'm asking for is how many in this people in this place would be able to raise their hands and say, I have in fact witnessed a miracle, personally witnessed, not just heard about, but personally witnessed a miracle. Okay, a healing. Now raise your hands. And just keep them up there for a second and look around the room. Okay, I want you to see something. If you wonder whether or not God is still doing miracles, you're going to have to get through all these hands. Because each one of these is a story that we could tell, and one of these days we will. We're not going to take the time today because I actually want to do some more heavy lifting than that. But it would be quite inspirational for us to hear stories like, for example, uh, when John Weber fell dead out in front of our campus at 173rd. And when the medics came in and told me he is dead, you need to come to the hospital, this thing just came into me, and it just overwhelmed me with faith, and I just knew the word that came to my heart was, this is not right. What is happening, him dying is not right. It wasn't that he wasn't dead, it was that he, this is not right. 
And so being a brand new pastor there, knowing, I, trust me, the thought went through my head. Wow, if I say this is not right and he's dead, and they've already told me that he's dead and he just stays dead, you know, the, you know there goes my credibility, you know what I mean? So that went through my mind. But, but I got to tell you, there was such a strong faith in me. There was just such a strong thing in me that I just said, look, you know, they've just told me to not say anything and come with them so that I can comfort the family. But I got to tell you, there's this word in my heart about this is not right. Does that bear witness with anybody else? I think doing these things in the, in, the, in the community is extremely important. And it was Eric Lee who was the first person in the back said, I bear witness to that. That's what I feel like God's telling me too. And then a couple other people said it. And I said, well, let's just stand on it. Now, you got to understand, it was probably 30 minutes by the time he'd gotten to the hospital. You know, he was there laying there for 20, and then it was another 10 to the hospital, and then they worked on him. So it was 30 minutes. And 30 minutes later, right as the doctor was saying, this is the pronouncement, you know what I mean, was looking at the clock to write down what the time of death was, John just sat up. You know? So do I believe in miracles? Yeah, I do. And, 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 you know, we've talked to everybody. We have a lot of doctors and nurses and so on in this congregation. And, and you know, everybody that's ever looked at it has said, that's a pretty good one. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you were to put that before somebody, that's pretty tough to explain what happened there because they were done. You know what I mean? And it had been an awfully long time. And he had, by, by the way, very important here, he had no extra damage. He'd already had heart attacks, so he had a lot of damage to begin with, but he had no extra damage. And that was one of the things that was the most baffling to them. They were like, it's as if he didn't just die for 30 minutes. You know, there just wasn't, there isn't any negative from this. Okay, and there's all kinds of great stories that come out of that. But you get the point. Okay, miracles are real. God does them, and he's doing them. And, and I, and I want to say another thing, too, which is, and if we begin to worship miracles, then we of all are lost, right? It isn't about worshiping miracles. We worship Christ. We worship God. Jesus is the one, the Holy Spirit does miracles according to God's will through us in the way that he wants to do, and we don't worship those, and we don't seek those out in an unnatural way. What we're doing is, as a congregation that tries to be very real about things, is we're just recognizing that there's a gap. There's a distance between what we feel the Lord could do and what is actually happening, and we want to close that gap. We may never close it completely. But we want to close that gap as much as we can, so we're just going to get real about it, okay? Now, in order to do it, here's what we're going to do. I sent out emails and letters and all kinds of things to you guys, and, and everybody responded. Not everybody, but a lot of people did, and it was just awesome, Facebook and everything else. And I'm going to show you a sampling of what people said, because what we're going to do is we're going to go through what people said about what's hindering us. And then we're going to open it up for a town hall discussion. It's going to take me about 15 to 20 minutes to do that, to show you all these scriptures and sayings and so on that came up. And this is what came from the body, okay? We, I asked everybody, we've got to do this as a body. This is what came from the body. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to open it up for you guys to talk about, so how do we close the gap? If these things really are issues that people have been identifying, what do we do about them? See what I mean? So this is going to be a fun day. If you do not have one of these in your hand, by the way, and one of these, they come out of the packet, you'll want both of these. You absolutely will want these. Okay, so raise your hands. We printed, printed plenty. We knew there was going to be a lot of people here because we knew that this was an important Sunday, that we're on a topic here that is a big concern of a lot of people. So please make sure that you get a copy of each of these. Okay? All right? Now... Right in the front here, thank you. Now, while they are passing these out, I hope that we can multitask, all right? Because I'm going to start talking to you about what people said, and I want to do this. The, the things that people said fell into these major categories right here, okay? The first one was compromise. By far the largest category of people's responses. You'll see some of the comments. Then lack of faith, which is to say not really knowing God, okay? And then praying for what he is leading as opposed to what we might think we should pray for. These will all become more clear in one second. I just want you to see the categories. And then fear and then evangelism. Okay, God using it to bear witness to him, right, and his character and nature. So now watch. And I'm just going to read through these. We're going to move fairly quickly. Don't try and capture all these. 
That's why I'm giving you these notes. By the way, not every scripture that's on these notes is up here. I just wanted to catch a sampling of each category so that you would kind of get a feel for the kinds of things that people said. Because this came from you, and I want, to, I want you to be sparked. And as we're looking at these things, here's what I want you to be doing. What am I supposed to do about that? Is that true? And if it is true, what are we supposed to do about it? Because that's what we're going to talk about, and we're going to take it to the next level where, as a community, we start talking about how can we get these things turned around. Okay? So here we go. This is compromised. Here's James. When you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver. For a person who, with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Now, come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Now, I'm just going to read these, but, you know, can I get an amen on that one at least? <laughs> do we see it? Can we get real enough with God to admit that we get it? That this is real? That he wasn't just speaking back to his audience in his day. He was speaking forward to us too. Because we're just like them, right? All right, here's another one that came up. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. A scripture that somebody used to say, are we really like that first century church? <laughs> okay, isn't it a fact that there were many widows in Israel? This, by the way, is the next section that Jesus goes into. He says, he sits down, he reads the scroll, he says, I've been anointed to, you know, preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the blind, to make the lame to talk, and, or lame to walk, and the, bl and the dumb to talk. And then he goes right into this, and here's what he's saying to them. He's saying, you got to understand, you guys want me to do miracles here, but you got to understand, you're compromised, and it's not going to happen. So watch. Isn't it a fact that there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah during that three and a half years of drought when famine devastated the land? But only the widow whom Elijah was sent to was in uh, Sarepta in Sidon. In other words, he didn't do a miracle even though there was a famine for the Jewish people. He only did it for a foreigner, okay? And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elijah, but only the one cleansed was Naaman the Syrian, okay? You know, hated Syrians. Now, now we're going to hit these, some of these thoughts, just a smattering of them. You'll find them in your notes, but then you'll find others too. I submit a thought in response to yesterday's sermon. The people are half-hearted need to become fully engaged, I think, you know, the person wrote me back right after they wrote that to me. They said, wow, I was being way too harsh. I need to blah, blah. And I said, being too harsh? Like, I'm leading with it. <laughs> you know why? Because I am. I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Kind of. <laughs> Depending. You know what I mean? Right now, here, I love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. But tonight, when I'm watching TV, is that where I am? Because I love this. This one is my, probably my favorite one of all of them, even though I love them all. Because every time I surrender something completely to Jesus, I swiftly find a way to grab some of it back on my terms. <laughs> right? Self-obsession chokes out God's spirit in our lives. We have sold our birthright of God's power for church growth. Church growth is good. The question is, how much will you pay for it? We need to sell everything to buy a field called discipleship to get all the treasures that God promises. But instead, we've made our service about entertainment instead of empowerment. Entertainment delivers what I want, how I want it. Empowerment says, here's what you need and how your life needs to change to integrate it. By the way, if you feel condemned when I'm reading these scriptures, you miss the spirit of what we're doing here. All of us admitting that this is real is us coming before the Lord and saying, we need to figure out a way to get this right with you because here's what we have learned through the law, through the Old Testament, and through our own lives. If you could have fixed it, you'd have fixed it by now. So if you get condemned by this and thinking, oh, I just got to work hard, and I just got to be more disciplined, and then everything would be just great, you're missing the point. The thing that we have to do is to acknowledge what's going on so that we can bring that before the Lord so that the Lord can start to do what only he can do in terms of getting us to where we need to be. You see, that? that's why I can read these things and acknowledge them so easily. Because the fact of the matter is I need to speak them in order to bring them, in order to watch God heal them. Right? So, I love this one. Perhaps it is simply this. 
that the means has smothered the end. I would submit this question. We have organized the church into something that no longer looks like the church. Have we organized? Christ described the kingdom of heaven in many ways, one of which is like the wind. How can we hold the wind, see the wind, schedule the wind, write the wind, brand the wind? How can we organize the wind? Perhaps our long history of organizing the church has resulted in something that no longer represents the church, the church that Christ defined. Here's the kicker. If we're honest with ourselves, most of us are quite content to continue on with the way things are. Why is that? The same person goes on. It could be said that most of what we call the church today is industrialized, branded, scheduled, processed food for the soul. We don't have to work at it. We show up and the guy up front tells us what it all means. It only takes about an hour of our time each week. You love this. Two plus hours if you attend Lake Sam. <laughs> Sorry, I love it. It's comfortable and we're familiar with it. And most importantly, it checks the box, so to speak. And most folks, I believe this truly occurs under the most innocent of intentions. Now contrast this status quo to a pillar of fire which touches down and speaks as God, the word from his own lips. It certainly would be difficult to work something like that into a Sunday morning service schedule or to turn it into a sermon series. In other words, flatly impossible to organize. Perhaps we do have a problem worshiping church just as it is, safe, scheduled, branded, wholesome, sometimes convicting, but always affirming, church. And perhaps that's the reason God cannot move in tremendous and evident power while we're there. Perhaps the church has smothered the church. Isn't that great? You see how good you guys are? This is real. This is important. As individuals, we stopped abiding. Jesus played all night and was shocked the disciples couldn't pray an hour. I know the legalism police will go nuts with this one, but this isn't about performance. It's about loving obedience. If Jesus says, follow me, it's not legalism to follow him. Authority flows from agreement. Agreement is forged by abiding. When we stop abiding, we stop having authority. We're going to hear that at the very end. I believe it has to do a lot with the lack of... Uh, has a lot to do with the lack of diligence in practicing basic fundamentals, both individually and corporately. We are called to abide in Christ, but how much time do we spend doing the things we know moves the heart of God? How much time does the church spend fasting, praying, crying out for a move of God? If we aren't faithful in the basic, basic things of the Spirit, how can we handle the advanced? Maybe healings begin when we care more about God, when we care more about God and others than ourselves. I love this one. Christians are more focused on the right to drink and cuss than the privilege of being like Jesus. <laughs> what we can do, not becoming conformed. Cleansing and surrender. We can't expect the fullness of the Holy Spirit until we're fully surrendered. Our own pride, will, agenda, plan, goals. America wants the Holy Spirit, but also wants the church and others to be predictable and not weird. We want the Holy Spirit until someone makes us feel uncomfortable or we have to give up too much control over something we care about. The Holy Spirit is all or nothing. We get the anointing we're willing to surrender to. I love that line. We get the anointing we're willing to surrender to. I don't think you get more gifts without giving up more control. My sense of the church in America is that we want the cool manifestations of healing and prophecy but are not disciplined for the daily, small, and seemingly insignificant as we wait for the magnificent. Is that good? Come on, this is for you guys. This is a better sermon than I could preach. I feel we don't practice enough. Every day we have opportunities to practice healing, prophesying, etc., but we pass it by. It seems to me the ones who are truly effective at ministry that looks like Jesus are the ones going out in love and doing it. Many who have a gift of healing prayed for dozens, even hundreds, before they saw consistent results, but they kept practicing and did not give up on their passion to heal others through Christ. Many of us are just too busy and sorry but self-focused, even on good things, and we miss the nudges from our Heavenly Father to practice. What, I'm willing, what am I willing to give up to be a disciple? Foxes have holes. You know, she's referencing that, right? The song, I Surrender All, seems a thing of the past. Let the dead bury the dead. Have the weeds grown up so tall around us that we struggle to even find the sunlight? Lauren Sandiford says the next move of God will not be about receiving from Jesus, but about becoming like Jesus. Man, I, I, that, that's dead on. That's super important. All right, second category, and they get a little shorter now. I just wanted to show you on that compromise one, because I think that, that's the one that we got the biggest response on, and that's the one that I think we really have to deal with. I think that's sort of first and foremost. Lack of faith, which is to say not really knowing God. 
Okay? Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe you've received it, it's yours. When you pray, don't babble on as the people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating words. Don't be like them. Your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask Him. See, faith and knowing God, totally hand in hand. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas, programs, advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your Father you're dealing with, and He knows better than you what you need. One day, Jesus told the disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city. One of that city came to him repeatedly, saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman's driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice. Then the Lord said, Learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a right decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And let me paraphrase that so you understand what that says. How many will he find on the earth that are even trying? Really. That haven't just become comfortable, compromised, and fine with that. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. Why? Because everyone who, who wants to approach God must believe that he exists. And then he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. Do you know God? Early on in my walk with God, I confused faith with risk. I thought they were nearly synonymous. Thus, the greater the risk, the greater the amount of faith. I, thought, I put this in here because I thought it was a really good... I think sometimes if you listen to me, you would make exactly this mistake. You would think the bigger the risk, the more the faith. That's, there's presumption in that. Right? I think there's a lot of risk that God will ask you to do sometimes, but it's not, it's not presumption. Just because it's a big risk doesn't mean it's God. And that's what this person says. The greater the risk, the greater the amount of faith I thought I was exercising. That led me to go way out into some dangerous limbs in the presumption that God would rescue me. As long as I crawled out there in faith and my goal was to bring Him glory. But that was goofy thinking. It led to some terrible decisions and it caused me to blame God for things that had nothing to do with His lack of protection and everything to do with my own stupidity and presumption. I wish I'd known that faith is primarily about obedience, not risk. Faith is simply trusting God enough to do what he says, no matter what the consequences. It starts with his clear and unequivocal leading, either through the Bible, the Spirit, or godly counsel. Faith is manifested when I know God wants me to do something, and I do it. It might be risky, and it might even be a mundane. A friend of mine, now this, these are the comments again. We're back to comments. A friend and I were troubled by a lack of healing power and went to a class. I told the teacher about my powerless. I love this. He said, start counting. If you get to 50 people prayed for and no one's healed, call me. I got to 10. I knew the 10th one to be healed. I just knew, and he was healed. I just want to say, be real about this stuff. You know, journal it. Somehow keep a record of it. Don't just handle it casually and not be going after it, Right? I actually came to the point where God gives us a, I actually came to the point where God gives us the wonderful and terrible option to believe in him and accept him or go our own way. The picture that comes to mind is when Peter steps out on the boat to walk boat to walk to Jesus. His faith gets him part way there, but I believe the thought that starts to sink him along the lines is this can't be real. I love that. My thought on your question is generally that the church has put too much emphasis on faith. Read faith as man's part rather than emphasizing God's grace. Not that faith is not important, but I find faith becomes a very natural and easy the more I focus, listen to this, on the finished work of Christ on my behalf. When we take communion, and I say that's that cup of the blood, I always say it is finished. It's already been done for you, everything that needed to be. We must put our faith in God's grace, which is fully finished at the cross and resurrection, not in our faith. This is most easily accomplished by focusing on Jesus and emphasizing his work, not ours. It takes the weight off of us onto him. If we want great faith, we must focus on him and his great grace. I think many believers in the charismatic churches don't really believe that we will do greater things in Christ. This is a hindrance. I think many pray for healing, but perhaps are shocked when God actually does. Or they think that healing is the exception rather than rule. I think there needs to be an expectation that God will heal and perform miracles when we pray. Great faith. We must focus on him and his great grace. 
I do think when we pray God wants us to use authority he's given us to heal someone. I know it may be nitpicking, but too often I hear solid Christians asking God to heal somebody rather than praying along the lines of, in the name of Jesus, be healed. We have the authority. Many don't know how to exercise the authority. I hope we're all growing in this. I think there needs to be on our part a stubbornness and perseverance so that we will not give up until we get that answer. God loves it when we go after him in this way. We don't act in his power because we don't know him well enough. Exactly the point of this section. We, or at least I, don't know him well enough to look at specific complicated situations and say, no, that's not God's will. His will is your healing. Be healed. I know my wife well enough to know what she wants. I love this analogy. Even before she does sometimes, she knows me well enough to answer for me in deep and difficult questions. I want to know God like that. I think we all do. But we lack the confidence, the complete surrender that comes from the most intimate relationship we have the most intimate relationship with him we can have. Just a few more. If I knew that my love, my Lord, my God did not want that, and I knew he was willing to act in a situation like this, and I knew he trusted me to call on him for it, then there would be no question. Then there would be no lack of confidence that stifles our spirits. His gifts, his action, his heart would flow from us because our relationship with him would be the bedrock on which everything we do is built. Wow. Our relationship with him, this is what we need to focus on, I think. As we draw near to him, his life will flow through to us, and we won't be able to help acting in the gifts because we know God wants this. Can you say amen to that? Is this solid stuff? The reason the gap between what we read and are seeing is our focus on the part that we're doing, is, uh, on our part, and doing it just right which leads us to a works performance-based faith which always fails because we know our faults. If we're focused on our doing, then our faith is undercut because it rests on our goodness, power, or faithfulness rather than Christ, goodness, power, and faithfulness. When I feel distance from the work and presence of Christ, I spend time each evening writing down one-sentence reminders of his presence. Whether that is in a flower growing in the sidewalk or a conversation with a friend, an interaction with one of my children, or... This simple exercise helps keep fresh in my mind that God is always walking beside me. I just need to be reminded and take notice. I sometimes think that when we become aware of how God is already working all the time, then he's able to do more because we're comfortable in his relationship with us and we're comfortable walking in his shadow. Then he can push us out of our comfort zone into greater things because we trust and know his presence and voice no matter how he's using us. Do you see how many people are linking faith and knowing him? intimacy and faith i think that's absolutely the key to faith i think if you have faith in faith you put your faith in the wrong place i think when you have faith in him knowing his character his nature the more that we grow in that i think the more that we're growing in his ability to move through us okay spiritual gifts identify god's presence within the community Oh, these two right here, this is number 50 and 51 on the slide. But anyway, these two right here, these really belonged under evangelism, okay? I just didn't catch it until I was reading it earlier today. Spiritual gifts identify God's presence with the community who is to be his witness. It's not about the individual. Nuance, individuality is important. There are different gifts for different individuals, but the purpose is about community health and community witness to the nations. See the evangelism? remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you want it'll be done for you my father's glorified by this that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples oh these are these are we've switched a category here and we're almost done sorry this is getting a little longer than i thought praying for what he is leading can i tell you i think that this is absolutely key to actually seeing fruit don't pray what you think don't go in there and your heart tells you what to do go in there and seek god and then do what he tells you to do. This is what the scripture says. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want, it'll be done. My father's glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son of man can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. I don't speak on my own authority. The father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. Even Jesus wasn't doing it in his own strength. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. 
these comments right here are some of the most important ones in the whole section. I, I know I've gone a little long and I can feel it, you know what I mean, that you're done with me reading crap. <laughs> but let me finish, because these are really important, okay? I noticed while reading This Is That by Amy, Simple, by Amy McPherson that she often prayed until she heard the Lord, and then she would say, in the name of Jesus, insert body part here, be healed. Often not praying, now listen to this, often not praying or healing what was requested. I have some, had some success with this message, although this microwave Christian often runs out of patience before she hears the Lord speak. Amy had thousands come to her meetings prior to Angela's temple. The numbers listed as being healed are much lower than thousands. She didn't do blanket crowd healings. She seemed to hear God's voice individually for each person. One would be at the altar and she would pronounce the healing and ask them to walk or talk or see or hear. Unsaid was that another right next to the healed one remained unhealed. Catherine Kuhlman tarried sometimes for an hour or so before she started praying for people to be healed. She paced and walked, presumably waiting on God. I love this. Tearing? I don't even know what that means. I want microwave results. The Holy Spirit began to talk to me about praying according to His will. Three ways prayer is initiated. One, we personally initiate the prayer. Two, someone asks us for our prayer and initiates prayer according to their will, and then we join them in that prayer. Or three, God initiates the prayer. I have some very personal dramatic examples of God initiating prayer and miraculous things happening, as I'm sure you do. How do we move forward, to, how do we move toward the third and away from the first two? If God initiates the prayer, then it is according to his will. He hears and it is accomplished success. Fear. This is a big survey that was done about Christians. What are your top three fears? They weren't talking about miracles or anything. What are your top three fears? First one, fear of failure. Second one, fear of rejection. Third one, fear of sharing Christ, where I will fail and be rejected. You see it? They just totally fit together. What came to me personally as I prayed was, this is not really under fear, but I, I'm going to put it there because it, I liked it. What came to me personally as I prayed was, quit thinking so much about myself, focus on God, put him above myself. Quit thinking so much about what others think about me. They probably aren't thinking about me. Put others ahead of myself. I realize this is pretty fundamental, but it's apparently what I needed to hear again, since that's, believe, uh, that's what I believe he said. I, I agree. Fear is a huge thing holding us back. Not so much fear of looking silly. This is really nuanced. Not so much fear of looking silly or embarrassed. Rather, what if we pray sincerely for healing, asking God to move in his glory and power for his glory, and it doesn't happen? What does that mean about our God? Why did he not heal when we ask humbly and sincerely? Asking, praying for healing, and then having the prayer unanswered forces us to deal with doubts and questions that can be scary to face. It's safer not to ask and feel that God was silent or did not move. It is safer to stay away from all that and leave it to other people who don't have doubts, right? It's safer to keep God in the box in which we've put him. God doesn't heal. Now, this is supposed to be evangelism, but God doesn't heal so that we feel better. That's what heaven is for. In as he healed and the lost were saved, he healed to show lost people his power and his heart. He's a loving God who cares for people. Should have been evangelism on that. The justification of standing on God's word is to help other people in distress, other people who are weak relationally with the Lord, and people that need love demonstrated that originates from the Lord. The outcroppings of this type of help is to nurture a closer relationship with God. By the way, it's old school, the school I was instructed in, but it's solidly built on the word. Amen. Spiritual gifts identify God's presence within the community who is to be his witness. And it's not about the individual. That I, apparently I copied this one and didn't forgot to erase it. Nuance individuality is important. There are different gifts for different individuals, but their purpose is about community, health, and community witness to the nations. God doesn't heal us so we can feel better. That's what heaven is for. In Acts, he healed and the lost were saved. He healed to show lost people his power and his heart. He's a loving God who cares for his people. I am to live my life before him and before others, Christian or non-Christian, as a believer who is willing to pray at any time. In this, I expect God to work and want to hear from others what has happened. Christian or non-Christian, I will ask if they want prayer and put my trust in Christ to move on that prayer. I will not determine whether my prayer was effective or not. I will ask God how to pray even before I begin to pray. I know he will move in this way and in his time. I will pray as God directs. 
Instead of a lot of listening or counseling prayer, listening or counseling, comma, prayer will be my priority. God is bigger than me. Walking with him means access to him. He loves every person I will pray with and pray for. Here's what I got from God today about Bernaxis, what's blocking the church. First, 1 Corinthians 13. This section basically says, if you don't have love, the rest of God's work is nothing. Then I got to 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Basically, our walk with God must be authentic and transparent so that people can see Him. If we're about finding God's heart and letting Him live in us, it'll be less and less about us, at least our old self. In John, Jesus says that we should believe Him when He says He's God. If we can't, at least believe through the miracles He does. I think God intends miracles to jumpstart flickering faith. But real faith, the deeper thing, the bigger thing, real intimacy, real life with God is about unfathomably deep, powerful love shown in Him, ourselves, and others. Last one. I feel way more challenged than I usually do. I won't be praying this week about what's blocking the church. I'll be praying about what my life is really about now, what I want it to be about, and what God wants it to be about. This scares me a lot. But I realize again how much more I want my heart to be like God's heart. My apologies for that being longer than I thought it was. I didn't have a chance to read through it. I hope that you take that thing home and that you don't just let it sit, that you actually, this week and these weeks coming up, that you would take that and read through a few of those every day and just kind of let the Lord, along with your devotional, quicken your heart, quicken your mind, just quicken in you. What's going on, right? Because I think we're identifying really, really important things here. But here's what I want to do now. We're going to have two microphones going around the room. And I'm asking you to stand up, and I'm asking you to respond to this. It may be that you're saying, here's how we get out of this. It may also be that you just want to say, I bear witness with that on the compromising, or I, I, get, I get what faith is about more deeply, and I think this. You see what I'm saying? What I want us to do right now is to have a real discussion, a real town hall moment i may be asking some questions and so on and you guys got to be praying that he shows up and that this go the way that it should go okay otherwise it's going to be very uncomfortable but if you participate god will do something he will show up because he does okay that's his character his heart his nature he wants us to be dealing with what can we do about this do we agree with it do we understand it and are we willing to do something about it and if so what so as you heard all of those things Go ahead, you guys stand up. These are the two guys with the mics, okay? And, and they'll just be going around, just raise your hand, and I'll be calling out the names as to who to go, or, or if I don't, uh, whatever, I'll be pointing. Okay, so go ahead. Who wants to say something here? Get the conversation started. Go ahead, Bruce. Thank you. Um, By the way, let me just say one thing, and this is not about Bruce, it's just about everybody. Brevity is nice. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. No. Um, no pressure, Bruce. <laughs> no pressure. But 15 words or less. The the very character and nature of God. <laughs> that that's me. And Kurt. how he heals. <laughs> you nailed me, Kurt. You got me on. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, Francis Chan said something really funny. I thought uh, back in the day, um, he had somebody sit in front of him, and he was wondering what part of the body of God could this person be. The gallbladder, the kidney, the pancreas, and I thought, well, okay, I understand that because we all kind of come at it from different directions, but <clears throat> seeing this, um, as I look around, I imagine these comments came from people that I know out oh, here, yeah. and I don't know you deeply enough to, like, read into it who you are, but what I'm seeing here is good strong biceps, a nice strong back. I don't see uh, feet of clay. I see uh, uh, legs yeah. that walk, hands that grip, um, a mind that works. Um, that's you guys, and it's cool, and I'm glad to be part of this church. Amen. 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 Go ahead and work your way down, Adam, because it'll just make him feel a little bit, I think, hopefully. Go ahead, Kay. What's that? I don't have to stand. I'm too old to stand. 
You know, well, we'll, I would, let, we'll let you, but nobody else. <laughs> oh, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would just like to say, um, second what Bruce just said. I see so much maturity in what has been shared. It gives me great faith and hope for what we're going to be, God's, how God's going to be able to use this as a congregation. And the one thing that I saw throughout that, and I actually wrote it down before we started, is it's not, this isn't something that comes through our intellect. It's not something that we learn. It's not something we study. It's not a program. But it simply comes from sitting in his presence and learning to go deeper and deeper in that presence. Amen. And that, I think, will be the outcome as we learn to do that. And Amen. it's not even learning. It's, it's a heart relationship. It has nothing to do with okay. our heads. Okay, so I want to get real about that, okay? So somebody said, I think we need to get together and do more prayer and all that kind of stuff. And we have Tuesday night prayer once a month. Oh, boy, how what a great praying church. And we can't even get 15, 20 people to come to that. Now, you do go to that, so that's one of the reasons I can say this. But here's what I want to say. I'm not trying to condemn people into going to that. Does everybody believe that there's something of getting together and praying that's important? Do we all get that? Do we all believe that? So here's what we need to deal with. Why aren't we doing it? Here's what I could do. I could say, shame you and make you feel guilty and condemned about having to come. And then you would come, and it still wouldn't be right. You'd be coming in a different spirit than what was going to generate what we wanted to generate. The thing is, I think you need to go back to God and literally just have this conversation with him. I know that I'm supposed to go to the prayer night. I know that we shouldn't be having it once a month. It should be happening once a week and then once a day. I get that this is where you want to go with it. I'm just telling you, I don't want to do it. So somehow, I need you to do something in me that conforms me to your image as were those first century Christians that were making a habit of doing this. I think personal private prayer is really important, and I think that this body probably excels in personal private prayer. I really do. I know how many people do devotionals. I'm going to talk about them again today. Maybe we'll see what God does. But bottom line, here's the issue. There's something, too, to be had in this corporate time. There's something there. We all know it. We just don't want to do it. And I want to get real with God. I want to tell him I don't want to be there. See what I mean? I don't want to go every day. I've done that before. It, I, it was interesting, but I'm not still doing it. Why am I not doing it? Well, I don't know. It didn't, you know. But the thing is, is what I feel like is, is if we go because we feel like we're supposed to, we may as well not go in the first place because that's sure to die the, the nasty sort of painful, embarrassing death that it ought to. Right? What's got to happen is something has to be transformed inside of me. I have to want this to happen. I have to ask the Lord to conform me to his image so that I become a person who wants to be where he wants me to be. See what I'm saying? All right? The, this is a pretty good moment to be bringing this up because, you know, Tuesday nights begins the, the, the new false television season. And I think that that's a huge impediment to getting together and praying in the evenings. Huge. Let's be real. Does that mean you should never watch any television again? I don't think so. I don't think that that's what God has in mind. I just think he has in mind. How do you just move from where you are to where he wants you to be? Okay, go ahead. I got, actually, I have one over here finally. <laughs> well, I guess we're going to go there first. My section's then. a little shy. <laughs> you did do B.O., right? A little bit. <laughs> Okay, so when you were reading, I, I just wrote this down. I wanted to share it. So we are passive where we are called to be active and active when we are called to be passive. We want God to act and we want to, to control the grace that's given us. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. <laughs> Hello. I'm Hannah. And you got to stand up. Go. You know, we've asked him not to give the microphones oh. over because it's an old trick. Sorry. This is strange. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just had a couple thoughts on what uh, the woman over here said is that I think there's a couple things that, that could help people have the confidence or whatever it is that we lack to go to these prayer groups and things like that because I know I have very strong faith and I'm not comfortable going to them. Um, and everyone will have their different reasons or or whatever, but you know, there's, there's things maybe we, I don't have a solution, but things to maybe kind of think about that we know now about people, right? Like we know 
like 30 percent of the population are introverts right and they get their energy from different things they participate yeah. different they have different needs so how can we think about you know 30 percent of this church is never going to want to get together in a big group and be super social so what means can we provide knowing that to help facilitate it I don't have Brilliant. an answer but maybe there's a lot of smart people here obviously they people can think about things and um Forgetting my second point. Brilliant. Dude, hold on for one second. Mm -hmm. that, this is Joel and, and, and Hannah Pelly. They're kind of new to the church. I mean, they've been here for a, a little while right now, but you guys got to get to know them. This is a really solid. Every time I get together with them, I walk away going, I feel like there's a little more God on me than there was before. You know what I mean? Just really great people. So, but, but I want to say something. I think she just brought up exactly what we're talking about. This is what this is, right? As an extrovert, I'd have never thought about doing that in a prayer. I mean, in a sermon, right? But here's an introvert saying, hey, let's think about this. And I want to challenge the introverts to do exactly that. How do you do prayer corporately as introverts? Think about it. Write me. Okay? You write us. Get some information back to us about, I think this might work. We're going to have some innovative idea about how to do prayer in a way that, that may just break loose something. Right? So brilliant. Did you, did you remember your second point yet? There you go. So the other piece is... Um I know for a long, well, I guess there's a couple things, is that, you know, when we look at people, um, there's, there's this new thing they call kind of the Facebook phenomenon, right? So if you're on Facebook, you always see these pictures and postings, and everyone's life is exciting and fun and good and perfect and beautiful people, and you're just kind of like, oh, well, that's really great for all these people. My life is not great, right? Because we all have our personal challenges and journeys and things, and so you kind of end up feeling kind of worse about yourself, right? Yeah. Where... I like this because I think everyone's being very real and honest about the fact that we all have these challenges and things that we're kind of going through. And just through being honest, it opens up other people to be honest and to feel like you have more of a community and a way to Amen. connect and help each other, that it's tough for all of us Amen. in our different ways and at different times. Times Sometimes things are awesome. Sometimes things yeah. just suck, right? Yeah. Um, and my third point, which this is not 15 words or less, is that... Um, you know, I know, like, at least for me personally, I don't feel like I'm very good at praying. I can have, you know, my heart in the right place. Um, but I kind of feel like I just kind of don't get it um, to do it in a way that's effective and meaningful, not asking for what I want. And maybe if we just had some, not that there's one way to pray, but some guidance and kind of how to do that and so be comfortable cool. doing that. And so, so cool. maybe in a group situation, I'd be more comfortable to speak up because I have a little bit more of a clue about what I'm doing. It's awesome, Hannah. Look, remember, this is the beginning of a conversation, right? A long dialogue that we're going to be having for as long as it takes us, right? And the point is, is what I want you to do is, is, is be bringing these things forward. These are some thoughts that would be helpful to me. I do want to say one thing. If you take her second point and her third point, and you mix in that she has become deeply aligned relationally with some other people, they go away a little bit. Right? You're not as afraid on the introvert part. And you're not as worried about what you do right and wrong. See what I mean? So there is something to really connecting as a community, to really actually getting those relationships going so that you get comfortable. Small groups is a great place to start doing that. We're going to be promoting small groups next week, but okay. Kevin, hey, before Kevin speaks, Kurt, I've heard you say a couple times, I want your thoughts, email me. Can you just give out your email address that... Uh, it's Kurt Brunk at lakesam.org, and it's all over the website. Yeah, it's all over just everywhere. Just in case you didn't Anybody know, Kurt, can email me anytime. Kurt B. at Lake Sam. It's all over the internet. Uh, so because I'm a musician, the metaphor works for me, but I'm pretty sure this applies to every um, career or skill. Um, as we were going through the compromise, lack of faith, I felt like I was saying, as a musician, you learn scales, and then after you learn scales, you can learn how to do chords and after you learn chords, you can learn how to play really cool chords. And then from there, you can learn more and more and more, and you build. But at some point, you still have to play a scale. Or you still have to play a chord when called on. And I feel like for me, God's saying, you forgot how to play a scale. You're doing all these deep things and all these great, wow. huge things. And you got to come back and do a scale. The wow. fundamental, basic part of what it means to know Jesus. I love that. I'm I love that. That's great. Uh, we're going to get there when we can, Rich. So is there anybody over here? Just keep work. work. Kind of go into the middle, you guys, and stay in the middle and work your way around the room. I've got another one back here. Okay, go ahead. Well, kind of going back to, you know, the prayer night and the encounter worship nights and people not coming. I, my wife and I went to one of the early worship nights, and it was 
really amazing. In fact, I'm always asking you, when's the next one, right? When's the next one? But I realize I've not said that to anybody else. I've not shared that that's been very impactful, that that, uh, you know, we talked about uh, when the person years ago died and it seemed so wrong, and coming just corporately and worshiping together seems so right, yeah. but I, I haven't grabbed people by the collar and said, you need to do this, because yeah. it's so right. And the prayer nights, I'm not necessarily comfortable when I'm driving here, but when I leave, it's like, that was worth doing yeah, enough that I come back then again. Amen. Thank you, Eric. October 27th, by the way, will be the next Encounter <laughs> Worship Night. <laughs> be there. Um, I was just thinking along with all of that, that if I think honestly about what I'm doing, I'm choosing my distractions. Um, I have a choice to either do what I think God wants me to do, like put my kids in the car and come to prayer night, or I can say, I'm really tired tonight. It was a rough day. I yeah. I'll do it next time. Yeah. Um, and I think that if we're really honest with ourselves, you mentioned television or even reading a godly book. If that's not what God wants me to do, then I'm choosing my distraction. And part of that comes with not wanting to pray in front of people, about wanting alone time, about a variety of things. Yeah. But I think we need to really think about why we're choosing what we choose. And I really do choose a good choice, but not the right choice. Yeah. almost every day when it comes to these kinds of things. You know, Serenity, I think, let, let's, let's watch something right here. Okay. How many can say one of the reasons why you don't hear prayer, like you in, even intended to go to the worship night or you intended to go to the prayer night. Or it's not about worship nights and prayer nights, but we're trying to get down to what's going on in our lives, right? So let's use this as a good example. How many of you have found yourself saying, boy, I really wanted to go when it was 10 o'clock in the morning, but now that it's 7 or 8 o'clock at night, it's been a long day, I'm really tired, I'm worn out, and I just don't want to go. How many, can, how many would say, that's one of the things that keeps me from, from doing things, right? Now, I'm shocked at only that many hands. Are we sure if I just put everybody else to sleep? Raise your hand if that's like you. Because, boy, I, tell you, I thought that every hand would go up on that one. But there's quite a few hands, but now watch. What if you go to the Lord and you say, you know what I really want to do is I want to be a person who wants to go to the things that I know that you want me to go to. Do you really want me to do that? God, how can I get to where I want to do that? And what if the Lord comes back to you and says, well, I want you to work on creating margins in your life so that by 7 o'clock you're not just a mess. You know, you haven't been sprinting for the last 12 hours to where you're, you legitimately are worn out. You know what I mean? Now all of a sudden what God is doing is he's not just getting you to a prayer night. He's healing your life. Do you see how getting real with God has much more? When God's doing one thing, he's always doing more than one thing. And if we go to God with what's real in our life, what I believe is he's going to come back and start changing all kinds of things in our life in a way that we can look and we can go, I'm, I'm living a better life now. Because I got real with God, and I got real about what I think he's probably telling me to do, but that I'm sort of shutting up because I just don't have the energy and the, the whatever to do that. As soon as you said that, the word that came to my heart, I believe it was the Lord, is he said margins. Now, you have kids. Margins and kids hardly go together. Okay? But there's a solution there, too. You also have people that are coming over from the church helping with your kids. And there may be something that God would do in a way that would create margins in your life, that would create a, a, a refreshing of the well in a way. You're saying we choose our distractions. That's true. I want to say it's even more true that we sort of fall into the distractions that are making the most noise and that seem kind of the easiest to fall into. Email. Right? How many people have been, have been caught off guard and taken in the wrong direction in your life? You were trying to get to something, but you had to answer a few emails. And two hours later, you're still going, what the heck kind of a jungle that I just walked into? Okay? Now, if God starts to heal us from those things, if God starts to bring us to another place, good stuff. Rich? Yeah. I'm going to hold your arm. I'm not going to hold the mic. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'll keep, I will keep it brief. Um, tying in the thing about prayer and what we should pray, along with one of Justine's messages a couple weeks ago, when Jesus was driven into the wilderness, what was the first thing the devil tempted with was pray that these rocks be made food. 
you know, pray for some food. Okay, Jesus, when they said, teach us how to pray, he said, you know, give glory to the Father, and he said, give us this day, our daily bread. He took it. He remembered what he went through 40 days ago huh. for it. He was, Hebrews tells us he was a like man with passions, and he intercedes for us. And this is the same type of stuff. Yeah. It's okay to have these things. This is God moving yeah. on your hearts. I agree, Rich. And I, that, I'm sorry, too. but I get worked up when... No, you're okay. You're okay. I want to do something right now. I'd like to just... We're, we, we've not got a lot of time left. And I want to do something. I really want to go down to another place right now. And here's where I want to go. What's it going to take for us to get to a place to where there's more healing here? I think a lot of people came to hear some solutions on this, and I think we heard a lot of what the problems were. I'm really trying to get right now to tell me what you think it's going to take. Okay, honest to goodness, what's it going to take for us to get to a place to where God can do more healing? So, did uh, you, Jenny? Go ahead. Sorry. We'll do Jenny, and then we'll come here, and and you're back over here too. Okay. I think. Um, we had a session a, quite a while ago when your brother, Dave, yeah. had his cancer. Yeah. And we, um, we were really pressing in on healing. And I yeah. think a lot of it is pressing in. And I think a lot of it is stepping out in boldness. And what really hit me during that season was it's not my reputation, it's God's. Amen. He's the one that, that has healing come through. We're a conduit. We, we do it. And as a result of that season, I step out whenever I can now. Because if we don't step out, it's not going to happen. But That's when right. we do, God is That's healing right. more and more people. Look at Dave. That's right. He's a huge testimony of that. Yes, he is. And I think we just need to step out every time. And when someone asks me to pray for him, I try to do it immediately. And not wait and not delay on it. And... It's not up to me whether someone's healed. It's not up to me whether that happens. But it is up to me to step out and to be bold in him and Amen. to take that step. That's and good, the other man. thing that came from that season was to thank God. Um, I mean, to give, to ask God to take our unbelief. The father that asked for prayer, if you, Jesus, can pray yeah. for my child, would you? And, he's, and then he says, I believe, you know, he told yeah. Jesus he believed, but he says, help my unbelief. And yeah. in the women's Bible study, we're, we're dealing with all those strongholds. And the stronghold yeah. of unbelief is huge. Yeah. And so just asking God to take this it. This idea of just pressing in, just pressing in, caring more about somebody being healed than anything that reflects back on you, whether it's being looking foolish or whether it's being embarrassed or anything else. It's just your just keep trying. Go ahead, Jesse. Jesse. I think there was a couple yeah. back here too. Okay, Zach. My ahead. session's on fire. So, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts, but we, but we got to be I'll, fast. I'll, I'm gonna. I'll be fast. So, <laughs> the the challenge that I have felt is that um, when I became a Christian, I kind of got into the charismatic movement, and there was a lot of things that I thought were happening that I really later realized it was just a lot of man. Not and all so, the So yeah, I mean, it was you know all these healings and all this stuff, and then, uh, you know, later it was, you know, a lot of unverifiable, you know, stuff. That's right. And That's so, right. you know, a lot of that hyper, you sure. know, uh, just, just craziness. And so what we're doing right now is talking about that, which never has been done before. I've never seen what we're doing right I now. I've either. never, ever seen this. What either. we usually try to do is conjure the spirit. Right? We want to work it up to create our own revival. So what That's we're right. doing is just super significant. Yeah. But, you know, what, what I want to say is that we use the word organic, right? I want it to be an organic movement. That's right. That we're not the ones trying to press into right. to, you know, the divine slot machine. You That's know, right. That it's God's moving. That's right, Zach. Um, listening to all this, kind of what I've been hearing is that the first miracle you have to ask for is you. <laughs> and that the first thing that you have to ask God to change and heal is your attitude and your spirit, um, and that you would actually want to press into this and that you would want this. Um, and as an introvert who loves prayer, something that's been brought up a lot, um, it is hard for me to go to the groups because that's just not where I connect. 
Um, and I've really been pressing into God, you know, how do you want me to pray? How do you want me to pursue? And really what I do is I just, every night just I sit down and I intercede for people in my life. And I talk to God and I pray through. And I say, what do you want? I see so much vision for their life. Um, and, you know, doing it on your own is not healthy because you can't check with other people. You can't right. make sure that you're actually seeing the right stuff. Right. So I go to other people in my life. And, you know, I'm a senior. I'm attending classes at a college. I have a job, and it's really hard to make time for that sometimes. But, like, I work for Serenity Delaware, who has three kids. And if we get them all down for a nap, we sit down and we talk through life. And that is so great. And Kimberly Jackson. And just working through life with the people who are in my life. Amen. You know, I'm not having to make time when I should be doing homework, and I sh I'm trying to go to this meeting, and it's just not working. That's good. Instead, I make time with the people who are already there with the Thank time that's you. already there. And it, it's not, you don't have to make a separate part of your life to work in the prayer. The prayer should be able to work in yeah, with your never, life the way it is. It's never going to work out if our life is one thing over here and one thing over here. This is the God part and this is the other part. The twain are not going to meet. It's oil and water. What God's trying to do is to get those things to absolutely fuse with one another. We'll go here, we'll go here, and then we're literally like going to do two more people and that's it. So I get, I'm glad for what's happening here. Justine's got her hand up, so she'll probably get to go, too. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm not used to talking in front of people, so I'm going to look this way. I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> but uh, what, I got, what I got out of that that I really liked was even Jesus didn't use his own words. That's he, right. He, he's, he spoke the word of God, so, you know, how am I supposed to do any different? And then on healing, um, I'm fairly new to prayer. I did have the experience to, to pray for a friend's mother. I don't know if it helped her mother, but it sure did help my friend. And so, you know, cool. that, that's a form of healing right there. Cool. And, you know, that, I, I, I can do that's that. Cool. Okay, Jen. And we're going to do one more over here and then one more over here, and then I, I got to cut it off. Okay. So this work, this work, this week, a word kept coming up to my mind in any places, and it's the word milieu. And as I was listening, what I was seeing in teaching, milieu teaching is where you take the environment and you allow children to learn from what's happening in the environment. In therapy, milieu is when you create a closed environment for people with really um, difficult needs and so they come into the environment and then um, the milieu counselor is just in the environment helping them learn. And what I was hearing from all of this is that we need to create a milieu, right? In the moment, in the place, when we're with each other, take the moment to do it. Good. Here, Alex, Justine, that's it. Okay. Okay, thank um, you, I love you. Just through all this, I think what came to me is just like, my biggest thing is fear, and fear of being rejected by people, yeah. and with prayer, and not knowing my personal gift, and just coming into like, Sam, I want you guys to know that it's really helped us as a family understand our gifting, but I look at my children, and just being like, being like them, I mean, they're not scared to do anything, and just having the courage like they have. I mean, my kids tell me all the time what they say in school and how people reject them for talking about God, but they don't care. And so I look at it yeah. as that's how I want to live my life, Good. that we need to go out and be like our children and Amen. not have the fear. It was what God said, right? Go ahead, Alex. And so then, um, lately something Jesse, just... go to Justine. Lately something that just keeps pushing on me is this uh, idea of stop struggling, stop fighting, you know, be still. And I think at least for me, you know, most of my prayers to God end up being more like an email. It's like, uh, hey, I think we should do this. Be cool if you show up. Thanks for the food. <laughs> Later. You know? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I don't know how to shut up, you know? And so I don't listen. And so how am I supposed to know what he wants? It's awesome. Um, I just uh, feel like on the flip side, I feel like I want to speak to shame. Um, for receiving prayer because I think on the other side we don't have enough people to pray for huh. and I I would want on Sundays for us to spend time praying for healing every Sunday and as somebody who has chronic illness with long-term treatment I need prayer every week and there have been people in my life who have said well you need to stop asking and now you need to have faith we're not going to pray for you anymore because you received prayer because of their own fear that their prayers were not being answered and that's not cool, right? So if you have a need in your life and you've been prayed for and you haven't seen an answer yet, 
we also need to lift that shame off. Okay. If you need prayer, get prayer. And if you're praying okay. for someone and you've prayed for them before, pray again. Right? Shame should not live here. Okay. okay. All right. I'm going to take about five minutes here, and then we're going to take an offering and say a prayer and go home. And I don't know. I hope the worship team can come up, but we're going to, we're late. Okay. We're about to head into a section in Luke that has to do with God. Jesus starts healing a whole bunch of people. These principles that we talked about, these things that we tried to sort of get quickened and so on, we're going to start seeing them over and over and over again as Jesus is healing people. And we're going to see these things played out in ways that I think God is going to establish them much more concretely in us to where we don't have these, to where we don't have these kinds of things. But I want you to see something. If there's one thing that we can do to move the ball forward in there, I want to tell you what I think it is. And let me start by doing this. Watch this. When you're compromised, you don't really know God. So you don't really have faith. So you don't even know what he's saying, and you can't pray accordingly. And you're very afraid about doing anything because you know it's all, not, it's all discombobulated. And you don't end up doing any evangelism because of it. How do you reverse that? Really simple. Devotionals. That may sound stupid. That may sound like it's not even on point. But I want to just make a quick argument to you about something. For the last two months, well, not the last two months, but for about, for about six weeks, I was on massive drugs. Very heavy-duty pain medication, and I was just basically knocked out. So I wasn't going on my walks. I couldn't even move. Then I had about a four-week hangover that I talked about here. I got depressed, didn't, didn't want to go do anything, discovered how people that are depressed... They really, they, you may have some sense of what to do, but you just don't want to do it, and there's just nothing in you to make you do it. So you don't do it. So I ended up about two months not going on my walks. Now, you guys have been here for a while. You've heard me talk about my walks. I started doing them at 19 years old. I'm almost 40 years into it now. Almost. Coming on it. There was one other section in my life that was a little bit like this, but just put that aside. But here's what happened in just two months of not going on walks. I entered into a totally different reality, a totally different world than I'd been living in for the last 40 years, truly. I mean, one that just like I talked about depression and I said, wow, well, now that I've experienced a little bit, I really feel sorry for people who have got this. My heart goes out to you. I want to say something. I went for two weeks without being in my walks and devotionals and a, a genuine devotional. And I would have to say, I don't want to see a show of hands, but I have to say probably 70% of the people in this room probably are not doing a, a full-on, genuine devotional with enough regularity to where what their life has become is intimacy with God at all times. Because when I go for my walk, when I spend time in the Scripture, when I spend my time on my, my relational walk, when I spend time with God, what happens is, is that I just get so close to God that no matter what happens in my life, if it's a church thing, if it's a relational thing, a financial thing, a health thing, whatever it is, I just got to tell you, when I see that thing, whatever it is that's happening... I see it like with this God light on it. And I don't see the problem as much as I see God working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It gives me, according to the scripture says, it gives me a peace that passes understanding. My understanding in my natural mind would say, wow, I'm in really big trouble. But I look at it, I see this God light on it, I, I see what God's doing. I don't just have a sense that he's doing something. Most of the time, because I've spent so much time with him in my devotionals, I actually see what he's doing in that situation. And so I look at a bad situation, and I have great, what people in here, a lot of people that know me would say, Kurt, you're really optimistic. Actually, the truth is I'm not very optimistic, naturally. What I actually am is I see the situation, I see what God wants to do with it, and I'm hopeful. So I don't see it as a bad thing, even though there's a bad thing happening. I see what God's doing with it, and I go, wow, this is really cool. And I end up, that's how I live my life. For two months, because of the drugs, I got knocked out of that. And I started living in the despair. Now, I got to tell you, before I was a Christian, I didn't know it was despair. It was only after coming into the fullness of Christ that I realized, oh my God, there's this other reality, this other truth, this other world. That is real. It's not psychosomatic because there's way too much fruit from it. 
There's all kinds of good things that are taking place out of it, all kinds of proof of its fruitfulness and reality, that it is more real than the things that are trying to kill me and trying to get me depressed and trying to get me down. And what happens is, is I go out there and I start spending my time with God and this thing wells up inside of me and now everything that happens in my life, everything, yeah, right, you know, but 99 or 98% of them, right, I look at them and I just see God in it. And when I see God in it and what he's doing, I have hope. And when I have hope, I'm good. Right? Let's go. When I spend time with God, I talk to him about the stuff that I'm compromised about. He has a chance to tell me what I'm compromised about because I may not be seeing it. And we talk through it in very real ways. Yeah, but I kind of want to still do that, Lord. You know what I mean? You know, what are we going to do about this? What are you going to do? And it's not putting it all on him, but it's just saying, what are you going to do in me that's going to transform me to the image of Christ where that is no longer in my life? And I end up being less compromised, which is to say that I actually end up knowing God more deeply. And when I know God more deeply, man, I got faith. Because I see and when I got faith, I know what he's telling us to do. And so I can pray according to his will. And when I pray according to his will, I know I have what I asked for, so I'm not afraid anymore. And that works to a fruitfulness in life that causes other people to want to come to know Christ. Do you see it? I'm telling you, everything comes out of it. We have our little saying our little thing here we put it in the lower left hand corner you know why because it's like a building whenever i see devotionals in the lower left hand corner that's the cornerstone you ever seen an old style bank that was made of brick there's a great big cornerstone in the bank right or a great big old building right great big cornerstone what you do is if you don't get that cornerstone right the whole building is going to be built wrong kinked but when you get devotionals right you get all the rest of it right if you don't have devotionals underneath it, you come to Sunday church, why? To do a church thing. If you're doing devotionals, you come to Sunday church, why? Because you can't wait to be with the people of God and experiencing the prophetic thing that God's going to do with us today. If you are doing small groups and not doing devotionals, you're going to have great relationships. You know what you're not going to have? Depth and intimacy with God. When you're doing devotionals and then you go to a small group and then God starts to move through you and other people to start ministering to people, you become that small group that even years later when you're all in different states, you're still as thick as thieves. All the way through, right? Serving. We're, we're asking you to sign up for serving right now. Serve without doing devotionals and see how it goes for you. And then serve doing devotionals. Because now it becomes a privilege and an honor. I think that God is moving through. See it? Devotionals is a cornerstone. Willow Creek said in spending two million bucks, what is it that caused people to get to such an intimate place with Christ that they were self-feeding in their life? Doing Bible studies, doing devotionals, doing the things, you know, being, just, just living a Christ-looking life, right? Not on the exterior, but on the interior wanting to be this way, being conformed to his image. What does it take? Two million bucks they, they spent to get to there. You know what they found out? 85% of the people that got to a self-sustaining place got there because of some major crisis in their life. They lost a loved one. They had a health scare. They lost all of their financial reversal. Some major factor had cast them back onto God. And they had found in their despair a God who holds them. And then when the crisis had passed, which thanks God so many of them do, some don't, but so many do, when the crisis had passed, they found it untenable to go back to life in that old way. And so they just kept pursuing God and self-feeding because it became life to them. That's the real daily bread, right? Well, here's what I want to say. Anybody want to go through a major crisis so that you can get close to God? I think that's pretty much a bad plan, although I appreciate you saying so. But I think pretty much there's a better way to do it. And it's to recognize that there's a crisis going on right now. And we're dealing with it right now. We've become so compromised as human beings 
as Christians, as a church, as people. We have become so compromised. We have lost so much, and we don't know it. We're the lobster in the pot, and the temperature's being turned up to a boil, and we're being cooked and don't even know it. There's a crisis going on. So embrace it. And go out there and start talking to God about it. God, what is going on in my life that is not you? And how are you going to work through me to fix that? Start spending that time with him. If we do this, everything we're doing about this Empowered series is going to come to more than anybody could imagine. If we don't do this, we'll end in an in a unempowered place. So, Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, this people come together with you, and we lift up this cup in which is your, your work finished for us. And what we do is, is that we say, God, in this lower cup is this piece. It's in front of you. If you're visiting here today, it's just reach in front of you. We reach in, and we put our finger into this cup that has the bread in it, and we say that we recognize that our lives have become broken and that Jesus Christ on the cross is the one who heals. And so we take this, and we break our bodies, recognizing they've been broken. But now we take it together, recognizing that Jesus has made me whole. He healed. He healed us. So take this cup together. Now, in Jesus' most magnificent name, in this other cup is the blood of Christ, which is to say that every single thing that needed to happen for us has already been done. There's simply nothing more that God has to do. There's something more that needs to happen in us. And so we take this cup and say, God, do that work. Get us to the things that you've already done for us so that we can move in them and live in them, experience the joy of them, experience the hope of them, experience the promise of them, experience the glory of God in your fullness. Healing, honestly, really doesn't matter. God, move through us and heal people. Move through us that we might come to know you so much richer that we might come to have a surpassing knowledge of you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, take this cup with that promise. Do it, Lord.